Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening, and we thank you for the gift of today. We thank you, Lord, for all the battles waged and all the battles won. We thank you, God, that you are victorious in every single thing. Lord, and we just ask, Lord, that as we come to your to your house tonight, Lord, with a willing and open heart, that you just deliver your message, Father, that you would use me this evening and just plant that seed in everyone's heart, Father, that we would be able to grow with it, that we would be able to know your heart for us, know what your word says about us. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for those listening over social media. We ask that you plant your word in their heart, that it may sprout, that it may grow into a mighty tree. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can take a seat this evening. I'm just going to dive right in. Uh, we're going to be talking about a message, a little, I, I prefer to call it a Bible lesson. Are you all okay with that? I, I prefer a Bible lesson. And my Bible lesson tonight that I'd like to share with you is something that God's been dealing with me personally lately. So I thought, you know what, I'm just going to share it with my church family and we're going to just learn together. And um I'm going to, the title of it is called Winning the Battle of the Mind. And I'm going to ask you to open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. And it's a much loved verse, but tonight I just want to, I want to break it down a little bit more. Is that all right? 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verses, I'm sorry, chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. And again, the title is Winning the the battle of the mind. So we're just going to go ahead and start in verse 3. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, for the pulling down of strongholds. Verse 5, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Woo, that's a lot of information. Okay, we're going to get through it tonight. Now, we're going to start with verse 3. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Okay. So we've learned at church, we've learned, we've learned here from pastor, you are a spirit. You have a soul. Your soul is made up of your emotions, your will, and your mind. But that soul is inhabited in a body. This stuff. All this stuff. So we are not battling a war of the body. The Bible right here in verse 3 tells us that though we walk in this flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Okay. Now, verse 4, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through, the, through God for the pulling down of strongholds. So the weapons of our warfare. Okay, so this verse tells us two things. Number one, do not be deceived. You are at war. We are at war. That's the first thing this verse tells us. The second thing this verse tells us is that we are not defenseless in this war. Why? Because God prepares his people. God equips his people. So, number one, you are at war. Be aware. And number two, you have weapons. You're not sitting there empty-handed. God wouldn't do that to his people. He equips us. Okay, so let's go to verse 5. The first part of verse 5 says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Okay, so this part of the verse tells us where the arena of our warfare is taking place. Do you know that... When Jesus defeated the enemy, he did it at a place called, da, 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 those of you going to Israel, Golgotha. The word Golgotha means the skull. When Jesus defeated the enemy, he did it literally at a place called the skull. God doesn't do anything by accident. Jesus defeated the enemy, he got the ultimate, 
I mean, he was the ultimate champion at a place called the skull because God knew that his people would be waging a war of the mind. How many years later? We're here 2,000 years later, and it's still going on. That warfare is still happening, not at a mountain called the skull, but in our minds. That's where the war is waged. So the verse tells us where the arena of our warfare is taking place. Not with missiles, but with imaginations. Not with bullets, but with thoughts. Because thoughts are the starting point of everything we do. See, because a thought becomes a feeling. And a feeling becomes an attitude. And then an attitude leads to an action. If you didn't get that, I'm going to say it one more time. If you want to write it down, I wrote it down because it helped me a lot when God revealed that to me. A thought becomes a feeling. What did we say before? We are a spirit. And our soul is made up of our mind and our emotions and our will. But we inhabit a body. See, a feeling, a thought creates a feeling, and a feeling creates an attitude. And based on that attitude, you're going to act, whether it be for good or whether it be for evil. Everything has a starting point of a thought. You're here today because you had a thought that you wanted to be in the house of God. This church is built today because someone had a thought that there should be a place in Dilly for our church to, to gather and worship. Everything initiates with a thought. Now, the second part of verse 5, it says, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, now that we know that the battleground is in our mind and Satan's weapons are thoughts, fears, doubts, and imaginations, now that we know that, it's not hard to sit here and acknowledge what Satan's favorite weapons of choice have been in the past years for each one of us. Because everyone's, the weapons he used against you are not the weapons he uses against me. The weapons he uses against each one of us are specifically made for us. And it's not hard to sit here and bring to mind the weapons that he has used against us year after year after year. Those thoughts that Satan brings time after time, the doubts, the fears, the imaginations that get carried away, and then those thoughts become feelings, and those feelings become attitudes, and things change. Now, it's not hard to recognize and acknowledge what the enemy's thoughts about us are, but verse 4 says that we are not defenseless if we know what God's thoughts are about us. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the thoughts I have towards you. Jeremiah 9, 11 is up there. Awesome. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Now, I like to bring this into the context of a conversation because God is talking to you. He's saying, I know the thoughts I have about you. I know what I'm thinking. How many of you have ever been in an argument with somebody who's trying to tell you what you're thinking. Anybody married? I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. If you've ever been in an argument with somebody who's trying to tell you what you're thinking, they're not going to get very far because you know what your thoughts are. And it's hard to convince somebody otherwise if they know what their thoughts are. And God is saying, I know my thoughts about you. You don't need to convince me of what my thoughts are for you. I know the thoughts I have for you. The question is, do you know the thoughts I have for you? Because you know what Satan's thoughts are. But do we know what God's thoughts are? It's right there. For what? He, the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, are thoughts of peace. Oh, we need peace. They're thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. That sounds good to me. It doesn't sound like anything the enemy's been telling me for the past, I won't say how many years. Now, we must not only identify which thoughts are coming from God and which thoughts are coming from Satan, 
But we must accept our right to exert dominion and authority over our thoughts. That's a right that you have. It's a God-given right that you have. I was a Christian a long time before I understood that I had a right to choose what thoughts I let in my head. A long time. And I sat in church my whole life. But it took a long time for me to believe and understand that I can take dominion and authority over the thoughts that pop into my mind. Because they don't ask permission. They just pop on in there. But that's not the part we can control. See, what the Bible is saying that the part we can control is what comes after they pop on in there. That doesn't mean that you can control every thought that's going to come into your mind. No, but you can create a checkpoint. You can create a checkpoint to decide where those thoughts go and what you're going to do with those thoughts. If they're going to be allowed to become a feeling, if they're going to be allowed to change your attitude, if they're going to be allowed to change your actions. Now, we accept our right to choose a lot of things. We're American. We think we have the right to do everything. We accept our rights, don't we? We're proud of our rights. How many of you exerted your right today to vote? We accept our right to vote. We accept our right to choose who our leaders are. We accept our right to choose what we wear. We accept our right to choose even the foods that we consume. Some of us are very picky. Oh, I don't eat that. I choose not to eat that. That's fine. We've grown up understanding that we have a right, and we've grown up accepting those rights. But sitting here today, how many of you have accepted that you have the right to choose the thoughts that come into your mind? If not, that's what we're here for tonight. That's all we're here for tonight. Now, First, it starts by knowing how to correctly identify the source of the thoughts that are coming through that checkpoint. How do we identify God's voice from Satan's voice? Uh, my friend, Mr. Terry Hutchison, posted something on Facebook a while back, and I saved it. And I was go as I was going through this um, Bible study, I remembered, and I popped it back up, and I was like, this is good. And I'm just going to say it really quickly, and if, if you, if you want to write it down, do it. And if not, it's okay. But there's a difference, and we have to identify God's voice from Satan's voice. And it said this, where God's voice stills you, stills you. Satan's voice rushes you. Where God's voice leads you, Satan's voice pushes you. Where God's voice reassures you, Satan's voice frightens you. Where God's voice enlightens you, Satan's voice confuses you. Where God's voice encourages you, Satan's voice discourages you. Where God's voice comforts you, Satan's voice worries you. Where God's voice calms you, Satan's voice obsesses you. We're talking about the battlefield of the mind. Where God's voice convicts you, Satan's voice condemns you. Those are very simple ideas, but they are so true. When you're trying to make a decision, and you know that you're being rushed to make that decision, you better think twice. Whose voice is guiding that? Because God will never rush you. He will still you. He will calm you. When you're trying to, to learn something, when you're trying to do something for the Lord, if you don't feel like you're being led, but you feel like you're being pushed, you're being rushed, you're being discouraged, that's what? That's not God's voice. If the things that you are thinking do not sound like what I said about God's voice, then guess what? Those thoughts are not coming from him. They're coming from your enemy. Don't be deceived. You are at war. We are all at war. And it's not a one-time war. It's a daily war. You've been battling this war for days, days upon days, days upon days. And they turn into weeks. They turn into months. They turn into years. And what happens when you battle that long? You get tired. 
And you know what, what else happens sometimes? You get confused about who the enemy even is. Satan may have been throwing thoughts at you, negative thoughts for so long that you've accepted them as your own thoughts. And at some point, he doesn't even have to pick on you anymore because you've gotten so good at thinking those thoughts, he doesn't have to do any work. You're doing it for him. The source of every evil thought is the enemy. But that's not always where those thoughts come from. That's the source. But sometimes they come from ourselves. Sometimes they come from our memories, from our failures, from our regrets. How many of you have ever had a conversation with somebody and then three days later you're like, I should have said that. That's what I should have said. <laughs> Usually it takes me longer. <laughs> we all have those, I should have said, I should have said, I should have thought, I should have done. And those things play in our minds. But you know what? When we can correctly identify where those thoughts come from, then we, then we can pass them through a checkpoint and we can do what the word is teaching us to do. Now, God's plans for you are good. God is a God of love and order. If the thoughts that you are thinking don't feel like love and order, then they're not from him. All right? Now that we know what God's thoughts are for us, can we go to Amos 3.3? It's a very simple verse. Can two walk together unless they are agreed? How can you walk with God if you don't agree with God? See, because just knowing what he thinks about you isn't enough. You have to be in agreement with God about what he thinks of you, on you, for you, for your life, for your future. You have to be in agreement with him. Let his thoughts convince you of what he has in store for you. Now, firstly, we must identify. Secondly, we must take the thoughts captive. How, Sister Christina, how, how do I take my thoughts captive? With truth, not fear. 2 Timothy 1.7. With truth, not fear. How do I take these thoughts captive with truth, not fear? 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. There it is again. There it is again. God only gives us one reason in the Bible not to fear. He just says, fear not, I am with you. But guess what? That's the only reason we need. That's the only time he ever gives you a reason not to fear. Fear not, I'm with you. That's all you need to know. That's all you need to know. See, God has not given us a spirit of fear. What does this verse tell us? It tells us that fear is a spirit. Fear is a spirit. It's a spirit. It's a lying spirit. How do you know the devil's lying? Because his lips are moving. God has not given us a spirit of fear. This verse tells us that fear is a spirit that creates what? A feeling. The spirit creates a feeling. But if we take it captive before it can get there with God's truth, then what can we do? We can cast it out. We can take it captive and cast it out before it becomes a feeling. Now, Satan doesn't flee when we speak our feelings. Have you ever tried to fight Satan with your feelings? Don't work. But Matthew 4.4 4 tells us what does cause Satan to flee. Matthew 4.4. 4. Jesus himself. He faced him. He faced Satan. He faced the temptation. But Jesus answered and said, it is written. That's it. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. See, because Satan doesn't have to flee when you talk about your feelings. Your husband might. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You want to sit and talk about your feelings all day, 
You're not going to get the enemy to run. But all you have to say is, it is written. And what does he do? Gone. Jesus gave us the weapon. He told us how to use it. He said, my word is for you. Use it. It's okay. No charge. Now, how long should it take for us to use God's word? 1 Peter 5.9 says, resist the devil at his onset. It's okay. We don't have to put that one up. Resist the devil at his onset. Meaning what? Don't let the thoughts that the enemy's putting in your head hang around in your mind, making friends with your spirit and affecting your will and your emotions and then affecting your actions and your attitude. Don't give Satan time to work in your head. Resist the devil at his onset. Meaning what? As soon as you feel it, as soon as you think, you think it, as soon as it pops in there, don't let it sit there and... and you know, grow, have time to germinate, get its little roots deep in your brain. No, immediately identify it and cast it out with the word. Don't take your time. Don't take your sweet time with it. Battles are not won when people take their time. Now, how do we do that. How do we do step three? Casting it out. Step three is bringing every thought to the obedience of Christ. The first thing we have to do is identify which thoughts are coming from the enemy and which thoughts are coming from God. The second thing we have to do is take those thoughts captive with the word of God, with truth, with what God says about us, not with fear. The third thing we have to do is bring every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, can we go to 1 John 4.4? 4. Bringing every thought to the obedience of Christ sometimes requires more than a spiritual move. Sometimes bringing every thought to the obedience of Christ requires a physical action. It may require that we extricate ourselves from certain conversations, certain friendships, certain relationships. Let's read verse 4-4. Four, four. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Now, if we're going to bring every thought to the obedience of Christ, we must understand that we are not of the world. We are here but we're not of the world. In fact, we've already overcome the world. But if we're going to bring every thought to the obedience of Christ, sometimes it requires action that is hard to do. Sometimes it requires surgery on your phone. That delete button. Swipe left. Delete that contact. Delete that friendship. Why? Because this has become the source of about 80% of the thoughts that come into our mind, whether it be from a phone call, a text, a news feed, uh, a report on the news, how the stocks are doing, I don't know. But this has become something that is constantly feeding thoughts to us. Now, Taking every thought and casting it out and bringing it to the obedience of Christ sometimes requires more than just a spiritual move. It requires a physical action. It requires you to sever friendships sometimes that are toxic. It requires you to extricate yourself from certain relationships, maybe jobs. Um, I don't know. But you do. Because God's word convicts you. I can't convince you. God's word will convict you. And when you feel that conviction, understand that that's God's voice speaking to you. Take action. Just like you have to resist the devil, you have to accept and get in agreement with God's word. There's two things to do with the thoughts that enter our mind. If they pass through the checkpoint and they flag as one from the enemy, get rid of it. 
cast it out with the word. I don't feel like it today. I can't do it today. You know, sometimes I wake up and the first thing in my head is, uh, 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 not today. No, I can't do it today. But the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's what I have to think. Even when all I want to do is say, nope, not today. And pull that cover over my head. Sometimes I get up and as soon as my feet hit the floor, I'm not young anymore and I feel that. Those feet have been wearing heels all day and they, they tell me about it. And I feel like, oh, my body. But you know what? I'm healed by the blood of the lamb. I am covered and I am healed by the blood of the lamb. And so I have to speak that word. I have to agree with what God says about me. Instead of agreeing with what my body and what the enemy is telling me of how I'm feeling. Feelings don't win battles. The word wins battles. Now, keep in mind that you catch what you're close to. Did you get that? You will catch whatever you're close to. So if bringing every thought into the obedience of Christ means that you have to remove yourself from certain situations, then so be it. How many of you are worried about catching a cold right now, catching the flu right now, catching the coronavirus right now? Everybody's so worried, and they're so, I mean, the world is just all over the place because they're so afraid of catching. Why? And so people, I mean, you can't find hand sanitizer to save your life. It's gone. It's all gone. People are so careful about protecting their immune systems, about protecting their health right now. But why aren't we as careful about protecting our spirit, protecting our mind, protecting our heart? We stay in those toxic. We, it's like staying somewhere where somebody's coughing and sneezing all over you. They're telling you negative, 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 so-and-so this, so-and-so that, gossip, gossip, gossip. And instead of extricating ourselves from it, we stand right in it, and we allow those germs to just get all over our spirit. We are, thinking, we are thinking about protecting our immune system right now. What we ought to be doing is thinking about guarding our heart. Why? Because Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 tells us. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. And I'm almost done. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of of life. Can I get the um, the maybe not the new. Thank you. It's the NLT. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. It. What did we say at the beginning? Your heart is not the muscle that pumps blood through your body. It's really not. You are a spirit man. You have a soul. Your soul is composed of your will, your feelings, and your mind. That's your heart right there. Guard it with everything that you have. More than you guard yourself from the flu right now. Guard your heart. Protect it. Because from it, it is determined the course of your life. God has a plan for you. But don't be deceived. Satan also has a plan for you. It would be wonderful if only God's plan showed itself. But Satan gives you opportunities every day to follow his plan for you. And those opportunities usually come in the forms of thoughts, temptations. The Bible has told us tonight that Number one, there is a battle going on, but we are not defenseless. We have weapons, and those weapons are truth, the word, the sound mind that God has given us. Take those thoughts like the word tells us that we can. Take those thoughts captive. Create a checkpoint in your mind. Create that checkpoint every day. It's not enough to be diligent about it once. This is a daily thing, guys. We have to get up every day and fight this battle, knowing that we are fighting the battle. 
if we walk through the battlefield unaware, we're going down. We must be aware of where this battle is waged in the skull. And we must be aware who our enemy is. The same enemy that was fighting Christ at Golgotha. He's still alive today and he's trying to get us. But also be aware that you have already won because you have already overcome the world. Jesus has already won that battle. He won it for you and he won it for me. All he expects of us is to get in agreement with him about what he says about our lives. I'm just going to end with this. I heard a testimony on a pastor the other day, and he was talking about something called the lizard brain. Have you ever heard of the lizard brain? Okay, I'm going to bring it up because I, I don't, I'm not that scientific. But it was something called the lizard brain, and it's actually scientific. It's um, something that's called the triune brain, and... Um, People call it the lizard brain because it's the part of the brain that is phylogenetically very primitive. Now, the lizard brain uh, is the limbic system in our brain, and it's about all the lizard has for brain function. That's why they call it the lizard brain. It is in charge of fight, flight, feeding, fear, freezing up, and fornication. That's the part of our brain that the lizard brain is in charge of. Now, the pastor was talking about how his seven-year-old daughter wanted really badly to swim all the way across her pool underwater while holding her breath. And it was a long way. Her two older brothers hadn't done it, but she wanted to do it. And so this man tells this little girl, okay, I believe you can do it. I believe you can get from here to there without coming up for air. But be careful of the lizard brain. Daddy, what's that? He said, the lizard brain is a part of your brain that's going to be telling you every, with every single stroke, you're going to die, you're going to die. Come up for air, come up for air, quick. That lizard brain is going to tell you, come up for air. But if you, will, if you will ignore it, you'll get to the end. She said, all right. So she got in the water, and off she went. Took longer than her dad thought it would. But all of a sudden, she pops out of the water on the other end of the pool. And you know what she says? Man, that lizard is loud. Man, that lizard is loud. And her daddy says, yeah, but what did you say to it? What did you answer it? I told it, I don't care what you say, I'm getting to the end of that pool. If a child can understand that she must battle the thoughts in her head, we can understand it too. Yes, the lizard is loud. It's going to be loud because it's the fight or flight part of your brain. And sometimes you're going to feel like you're in that war and you need to run. But Jesus says, it is written. And when he says it is written, the enemy flees. You can do the same thing. Now, this battle has been going on since the beginning of time. Adam and Eve, that's when it started. When Eve was convinced by something beneath her, of what she had to do. Eve allowed something beneath her to tell her what she was going to do. That lizard has been alive for a lot of years. That serpent has been alive for a lot of years. Now, you're not alone in this. We have all been battling this war, but we are all victorious. Are you convinced today that you are victorious? Are you convinced today that you have the weapons necessary in your arsenal to beat the thoughts that come into your mind that are not of God? Praise God. Go ahead and stand to your feet, and I'd like to just say a prayer with you tonight. Remember, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, the thoughts that I think about you. God knows exactly what he has for your life exactly what he has planned out for you, not just in the future, but even tomorrow, even this next very hour, God knows what his plans are for you. If we will stand in agreement with him, we will see his hand move. We will see the plan of God unfold in our lives. It is time to stop the enemy's plan in our life. It is time to stop letting him have say in what comes into our mind. We are done with that. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening, and we just praise you, God, for the victory. We praise you because we are a triumphant church, Lord. We praise you because we can do what you say we can do. We are who you say we are, and we have no need to listen to a lizard that is beneath us that has been speaking lies into our lives for years. It is done because your word says that you have overcome the enemy. And this night, we take it back, Lord. We take back control of our thoughts. We accept the right, we accept the responsibility to take captive every thought, bring it into dominion in your name, in Jesus' name. Father, we praise you, we love you, we thank you, God, that you think only good thoughts about us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being part of our service today. We pray that you had a blessed time. Please take time to connect with us online at connect at christianfaithcenter.church and be sure to mention your prayer request. We would love to hear from you. You can also check out our website at www.christianfaithcenter.church for more information on any upcoming events. On Facebook, you can find us as Christian Faith Center Dilly, Texas. Hope you will join us next week for a great time in the Lord. God bless.